but I'm trying to build up the evidence, build more scholarly published research that will allow us to begin to do more research that isn't like a an ethical issue with institutional review boards. So the scientific process is very complex. It's long, it's drawn out, and it takes a lot of time. And I think that a lot of the naysayers, not only do they have no understanding of nutrition in the first place, but they don't understand the scientific process. And um, so my goal is to get this PhD published, to try to build some guidelines to help provide I know that we're not. I'm not going to change the ADA's mind. I know that this is an uphill battle. There are so many other elements to our healthcare system and our nutritional recommendations, and I am not going to be the one to solve that right now. Um, but my hope is that, and you know, my plan in life is to be the carnivore diet researcher. And so I'm hoping that this is going to be the first of many, 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 many studies to really kind of give like a gut punch to those people who are like, well, where's your scientific research? But Mother Knows Best is a series for those who are interested in understanding the idea and implementing the lifestyle of meat-based eating for their family. Our children are born by sugar and processed foods, preservatives, the moment they enter this world. My name is Ellie. Hi, it's nice to meet you if we haven't met before. And with my husband, we're doing our best to raise our children with their nutrition protected. I invite other meat-based mothers and experts in this field to talk about a topic that isn't discussed enough, the importance of eating whole natural foods with an emphasis on fat and protein. Tonight, we have a wife and mother of two who works at her local elementary school with children with special needs. She is currently pursuing her PhD in integrative and functional nutrition. Her entire family are carnivores in the lovely state of Idaho. And she is very active, enjoying hiking, snowboarding, and exploring new places. I'm so honored to welcome Courtney, the holistic carnivore, to Mother Knows Best. Hi, Ellie. How are you? I'm so great to see you tonight. I'm so excited to talk to you. I have so many questions. And I know that you're going to give us so much wisdom to any <laughs> potential, like new parents that might be thinking, oh, what is this carnivore thing? Should I put my kids on it? And so... <laughs> Because it, it, there's a lot of questions that could arise, possibly. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you for such an awesome introduction. I really appreciate that and sharing a little bit about, you know, my background and my current reality. And I think you're doing an amazing thing here with your channel and helping other mothers to not only be informed about this transition to carnivore or animal-based or keto or whatever kind of avenue they choose to start, but also providing that sense of like camaraderie and community and showing that like this is real life and this is a challenge, but we are in it to win it. And we understand this is a marathon and not a sprint. And I'm just so grateful to be here and to be chatting with you. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. You're so sweet. I, I really appreciate that. That's, that's my whole goal with this show because I remember being a mom and finding keto and then later carnivore and just having all of these questions brewing. Am I doing the right thing? And mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes motherhood can be a little uh, isolating and also being a oh. carnivore is isolating. <laughs> and so I thought, why not give one place where mothers and like I said, experts also, but mothers can come on and we can just share our life experience and mm -hmm. it may take away some of that little scary uh, feeling that you may have or uneasiness. So I would love to get to know you better. Could you yeah. tell me what kind of foods you ate growing up and how do you think it affected you becoming an adult later and also a mother? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a very... I want to say typical childhood for growing up in, you know, born in the early 90s, growing up in the early 2000s. And I come from a family who are very grounded in their way of life, you know, very humble, very much, you know, we get it from the ground and we, we cook for ourselves and we don't go out much. And, you know, so my, you know, my grandparents, both on my dad and my mom's side, I remember as a child, they had massive gardens. 
absolutely massive. And so as a little girl, my sister and I, we would spend our summer days, you know, whether we're in southwestern Virginia in, you know, the heart of Appalachia, where my mom hails from, or in like northern Delaware, which is where my dad's family is from. We were constantly being taught about food. And, you know, we even worked in the garden as little girls. We would go out there and we would pick cherry tomatoes and we would pick green beans and we'd sit on the front porch, you know, shelling beans and preparing them to be canned. And it was this labor of love. And so from an early age, I was exposed to food being not just something that we obtain, but something we actually have to work to obtain and something that is shared with the community. You know, my grandmother recently passed and at her funeral during the services, um, the officiant was actually, you know, he was from my grandmother's really, really small town. And they talked about how, and it was a beautiful story. He talked about how over decades, you know, Brian and Geneva were the gardeners. And whenever you drive by, you go up to their house and they're, you know, bagging up something and just constantly giving and giving and giving, you know, what they had. And it was never, it was never much, right? So this was my exposure as a child. And I think it had a really big impact on the type of person that I am today. You know, same same thing for whether we were in Delaware, right? My sister and I would be running through the, I want to say the fields, but it felt like fields at the time, but like we're running through the garden and we would just grab a tomato or grab a bean or grab a pepper or grab a cucumber even. And it's literally like snacking, snacking, snacking on all these plants. And that was just the way that our life was. And so everything was homemade. Everything was from our land. Everything was from my grandparents' hands or mine and my sister's, my mom and my dad's hands. And that was on our plate all year round. And then every spring, we would start that process over again. So I was taught that homegrown was always best, right? I feel like I was able to make those connections and understand that the things and the foods in the store, they weren't as good as home. And even as a little girl, I'm like, I know these taste different. I know that they've had some exposure. They've touched a lot of different people's hands. They've been in the stores for sitting and sitting for who knows how long. And that's just we got the necessities that we didn't have in the moment from the store. And so that's how I kind of lived and began my life as a young adult and how I had decided, you know, before becoming a mom, something that was really important to me was ensuring that I was eating local and making everything from scratch, be it bread or biscuits or, you know, what whatever it is we were making and eating at the time, it had to come from me and it had to be that labor of love. And that was the way that I had decided I was going to live my life. And so now as a carnivore, you know, while the mindset has completely shifted, I still hold on to a lot of those local support the farmer type values. And whenever possible, I, I make sure that I'm getting local beef right? I make sure that the eggs are local. I try to reduce as much exposure to industrial beef and egg and bacon and all of the things from not just commercial, but getting them even from like grass-fed sources local are my priority. And I try to take it one step further and only source from regenerative farms who are using their practices to restore nature and bring life back to the earth. So those are the kind of values that I have today. And I think a lot of that is because of how I grew up, what I was exposed to, and listening to, you know, granny's stories sitting on the front porch, just breaking those shelly beans. That is absolutely beautiful. Like what a... It, as you were telling the story, I was just imagining little Courtney running through her, her grandmother's garden. And I thought it was so sweet that they were known for their love of and the labor and the giving and cultivating a, a source of, you know, independence from 
you know, these big stores and all these like chemicals that are in food today. And it was, it seems like you really grew up in a supportive environment. So I'm so happy to hear that with you. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I, some of the mothers that have come on, they've expressed, you know, their, their parents, like, just giving them like a box of mac and cheese or something like that. So um, it's, it's like a breath. And then later on, you know, learning about the, the importance of whole natural foods. And so whether you do keto or carnivore, it doesn't matter to me. I think it's, you know, like Dr. Ken Berry says, it's a spectrum. And mm -hmm. as long as meat is the main focus on your plate, that's, um, mm -hmm. so did you eat meat growing up? Yeah, we did. Um, you know, it's difficult to say. I don't I don't exactly remember where the meat came from in a lot of the instances. You know, I I remember being a little girl and my like my grandparents in Virginia. They're from this little town called Independence, Virginia in Grayson County. It is the middle of absolutely nowhere. And um, you know, so hunting is a big part of life. So when we were there, we were eating deer that had been hunted directly from, be it my grandfather, my dad, my mom, my uncles, wherever. And I can remember, I have very vivid memories of being in the house because I was terrified. I mean, terrified to go outside and because they would come home and I would see a deer in the back of the truck. And then, you know, I'm just standing in the kitchen, observing out the, the glass window. I mean... And they're hanging the deer up in the tree and proceeding to do the butchering process. And so that terrified me. Like, little Courtney could not comprehend, like, the intensity of that. So I just kept my distance. But I was able to make that connection to realize, like, oh, hey, they just spent the morning in the mountain. They came home with this deer. We now have food in the freezer. We now have food that's going to be canned for for later throughout the year. So but it didn't it wasn't just limited to deer. Like I remember my grandma always made and I'm laughing cuz I just still can't comprehend how or why. But like I've had groundhog, I have had squirrel, I've had rabbit. I remember one day we were driving through the mountain and bless him, my grandfather goes, "That's a snapping turtle." We're going to pick it up and put it in the back of the van. And I'm just sitting there like knees up on the seat, Ellie, terrified because I'm like, I don't know what a snapping turtle is. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And I'm very afraid right now that my ankles are about to get snapped. So, yeah. um, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that turtle became dinner. I don't, I, I, I don't know, yeah. but that's the, but that's the way of life. And that's the culture of the area. And, you know, as a, as a child, you don't, you don't know these things. Like, you know, we live in this world where it's chicken, 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 chicken for our children. And no, that's like, that's not how it was for me. It was, here's your dinner tonight. We're having groundhog. And I'm like, we're having what? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we having? <laughs> It's going to taste like deer was always the answer. Um, wow. But, you know, and then, of course, like as a as a teenager, of course, I remember going, we would go to the grocery store and get a lot of our proteins. Like I lived in Maryland. Um, but it was cool because we always had like this tie to whatever was native to the area. So in Maryland and Delaware, we had loads of blue crabs, loads of scallops and shrimp. And so seafood was a big part of our culture there. And then I had, you know, a lot of ruminant and wild game, we'll say, <laughs> in yeah, Virginia. Absolutely. So it's like I, I had this big exposure to, to wild protein throughout my life. So, yeah. <laughs> but so are definitely you... from the grocery store, for sure. Like that's, mm -hmm. come on, it's, it's the 2000s, 2010s as a teenager, like we we went to the grocery store. We had to buy chickens. We didn't grow up on a farm. We had a garden, but we didn't raise pigs. We didn't raise chickens. So we had to buy those things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's so great that you are um, investing in regenerative farming and you have an appreciation for maybe some <laughs> of the less popular forms of meat. Um, I've never heard anyone tell me that they've had groundhog before and that it tastes like deer. So that's good to know. <laughs> I'm open-minded, um, yeah. 
probably as open-minded as I am about organs on the carnivore diet. Not mm. very mm. sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. very open-minded totally. on it. Yeah, no, me either. <laughs> so I w- since uh, we've learned a, bit, a little bit about your backstory, I want to, you told me that you and your husband are both carnivore and you mm-hmm. are, can you tell me a little bit about your family and how you started the carnivore diet with them? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a mom of two. Uh, my children are three and five or five and three respectively. And when I met my husband in 2003, 15, 16, doesn't really matter. It's been a while. Um, At the time I was plant-based, vegetarian, pescatarian. I couldn't tell you which one. Um, I went plant-based when I was about 14. I have a really, really long history of the desire to be thin being impressed upon me at a very young age. I was, I was very bullied as a child for my size, which didn't make sense because I was, I remember my freshman year of high school, I was about five, nine, five, ten, and I, I maybe weighed a hundred pounds, but I was a cheerleader and really active. I've always been active my whole life, but high school is rough. No matter the, the time period that you're in, no matter what reality your life looks like, there's always something that's going to be said about you. And for me, I was, kids would say I was, I was overweight. They would call me fat. They would say, oh, I think you need to go lose some weight. And when you picture the reality of being this, the height that I was, and I emphasize was, um, and you know, the size I was skin and bone and I was being called fat and I was being told I need to lose weight. So when you're so impressionable as a, as a young, young child, you take those things to heart and then you start to kind of nitpick your reality and then you start to fixate on things and the your, your psychology becomes significantly affected from external sources. And I think that we're at a point in our social realm where we kind of understand that a bit more and we understand the impact of social pressure. And so, you know, early 2000s, I didn't know. We, you know, we didn't talk about eating disorders during this time of life. And so I... I was like, okay, they're calling me fat. I must be fat. I now have no self-esteem, no self-confidence. And so I'm going to do everything I possibly can to try to lose weight. And um, that began with cutting meat out from the diet because, of course, meat was villainized in those in those early years. And it didn't matter how lean it was. It didn't matter if it was chicken, pork, whatever. I I cut all meat off the plate because I heard going vegetarian would help you lose weight. So we didn't have internet at my house for the longest time. And um, so I was clinging on to just whatever I heard in the news or got from the media, or maybe my older sister had brought home a magazine that I was able to get my hands onto for about three and a half minutes before she snatched it away. And right, sisterhood. Um, and so the idea and the association between vegetarian and weight loss really stuck with me. Um, so not only did I cut meat out of my diet, but I significantly reduced my food intake overall and I stopped eating a lot. And I would I would hide food and I would kind of tell my mom, oh, I'm not hungry, despite the fact that I just went all day at school without eating. And I went to cross country or basketball or cheerleading practice or whatever I was doing during the season. And, um, you know, I kind of fell into those eating disordered and anorexia type patterns. Um, but that was the time that I went vegetarian. And um, I maintained that all throughout high school, all throughout college, and even into my my post-college years. And then when I met my husband um, in like 2016, I was still very adamant in my eating habits because I had learned a good bit about human biology. I was a I double majored in biology and chemistry during undergrad, and I kind of understood nutrition from the perspective and the paradigm that it had been taught in 2015, right? Which was the way that it had been taught in the 19, 1990s and the way that it is still being taught in 2024. And so I was very 
adamantly grounded to my desire to stay plant-based. Um, and then, and then a documentary came out called What the Health that I kind of jumped into very much. I know a new documentary has come out on Netflix that has a lot of people kind of jumping into dietary change. And um, like the current documentary, this one was very much not supported by actual science and very, very much a biased production, but I didn't know it at the time. And I wasn't informed enough on academic research and nutrition science to really understand and like recognize the flaws. But so here I was 10 years into or 15 years almost into my plant-based journey watching media that was telling me, oh yeah, 100% plant-based is great for your heart. It's great for preventing diabetes. It's great for preventing cancer. Be sure that you don't eat any more than two or three eggs a week to prevent colon cancer. You know, meat is the equivalent of smoking, right? And so here I am feeling so freaking confident in the fact that like, yeah, here I am 22 years old and I've been vegetarian for the past 10 years. Like I am set up for great health was the way I saw it. And so my now husband, I was like, this is the way we're going to be. This is the way we're going to live. And so we watched the doc and I was like, look, I would love for you to watch this documentary. So we watched it together, got him on board, and that's how we were up until the past year. And I'm actually coming up on my one-year carniversary, so it's really only been a year that we've been away from this lifestyle. Um, and so if you remember, my kids are three and five. So what did that mean for pregnancy? It meant that I was vegan for both of my pregnancies. It meant that my children have had, up until the past year, no exposure, and I won't say no, I'll say very, very little exposure to meat, eggs, butter, and animal products in some until the past year. And so, yeah, now here we are, it's been about a year. And for me, the transition was, I want to say gradual, but I think it was really more of a ongoing battle between me and my best friend who had, she and her husband had discovered carnivore. And a year ago, I was three in, on year three of my PhD where I was really focused on plant-based diet research and still very strong. And so we had about six months where we were constantly going back and forth and hitting each other with like, well, this about meat and well, this about carbs and well, this about plants, well, that about plants. And so we kind of had this really interesting you know, debate back and forth. And then one day she had texted me um, that she was eating butter chips. She was getting ready for a run. Hey, Courtney, here are my butter chips. And I know you're going to disapprove, but just so you know, I'm eating butter. And my heart stopped at the thought of that, Ellie. Like, I, I don't remember what I was doing, but I know I immediately went to my computer and I started doing all of the research on saturated fat, butter, cardiovascular disease, what the implications actually were so that I could actually be like, I don't want to say your name, like friend, this is what you're doing. I need you to realize. But I didn't get to have that conversation because it was me who had the realization of like, oh my gosh, everything that I know about nutrition from my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and now on year three of my freaking PhD, everything that I know about saturated fat is totally wrong. And so I'm in the position like, well, what else is wrong? What else have I been mistaught about nutrition? So I spent a long time at the computer that day and I was like, okay, here we go. We're going carnivore. I'm going to put my faith in my friends. She's a PA. Her husband is an MD. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to put my faith in them. I'm going to trust this. I don't know much yet, but I am so ready and willing to learn and uncover the truth about nutrition because I can't believe that I've spent 15 years of my life eating nothing but plants, eating nothing but plants during my pregnancy, exposing my children to all of these toxic compounds from the womb. And now four years into my, my oldest, my eldest's life. And so for me, it was, it was out with the old and in with the new. And I remember I pulled everything from the pantry, from the fridge. And I said, okay, we need to go to the grocery store. 
a year later, we're still carnivore. Wow. <laughs> Courtney, you've been through so much. Like, I just wanted to give you some validation because I understand just to circle back to your, the beginning of your story about bullying and feeling like inadequate and feeling and becoming ostracized because of the way you look, even though we know now that you were probably the most beautiful, being, you know, well, also, yeah, but I'm sure that you were, you know, Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I You're so sweet. That there's, yeah, I just want to give you some like like internet hugs because that is oh. so hard. You know, I've yeah, I've I've been there. You know, with yeah. girls talking in the locker room and you're you're hearing mm -hmm. that you're fat or mm -hmm. or you know the yeah. boys picking on you. It's it's hard. And then yeah. you found you know, what did you say you were a vegan or vegetarian? Or like a mixture of both. I've been I've been all the things. I mean, yeah, all you the were things. Yeah, okay. Vegan, vegetarian, mm -hmm. pescatarian, flexitarian, right. ovo ovo vegetarian, all the things, all the things, all plant based. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry that you felt like you were like. Did you did you have fear of that you were it, that of meat because of yeah. those things? Is that one hundred one hundred percent? Yeah, yeah, and oh I don't gosh. know if it was. I don't know if it was fear of meat, but fear of gaining weight. Right. And what we're being told is meat causes weight gain. Mm -hmm. Eating fat will make you fat. So I said, okay, no more fat. Low fat it is, yeah. which is what like everybody was doing at the time. So I was like, okay, here we are. Like this is this is the world. This is on TV. That's my only my only source of yeah. I want to say credible, but like, has the news, has it ever been credible? I don't know. Mm, it's I, don't know. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> I completely understand. When I found out about carnivore and kind of like the name of my channel, like I felt like our nutrition had been redacted from every single, you know, schools mm -hmm. and the news and everything. And I mean, I don't have a science background. I'm just like a regular mom, you know, stay home mom. I don't, and so I'm glad that I have your science brain so that we, because I do want to ask you some questions about that. Yeah. Um, but sorry, that was a bit, that was a long message. story. <laughs> no, I'm so glad you shared it because like I had, I had thought I had remembered that you were plant-based at one point and then I was like, oh, but I don't want to like, you know, I hope she brings it up because I want to <laughs> touch on that a little bit. Yeah. How, how do you feel physically compared to yeah. then and now? Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've, like I've mentioned earlier, I've, I've been an athlete, athlete my whole life. I'm going to start stuttering now. Um, I've been an athlete my whole life and I very vividly remember the early days when I first went vegetarian. Um, I like, I don't know if it was basketball practice or gym class, but I ended up just kind of blacking out and passing out and hitting the floor. And, um, of course, you know, I'm like, Oh, don't call my mom. And they of course called my mom who, you know, I got sent to the ER and, you know, they did all the tests and, Oh, well, you know, it kind of led down one way or another, but I was trying to perform athletically and couldn't. Right. And this is a trend that I didn't realize at the time was so detrimental. Um, but I went from being like a great athlete in my early, early middle school, high school life to very much not being able to perform anymore. Uh, like all of a sudden I couldn't finish my cross country races without like keeling over and just like having to take a break and sit down on the hill or running and like really holding my side from side, side stitches and just not being able to perform all of a sudden, which didn't make sense because I've been training my whole life and well, what's going on? But, you know, I cut meat out of my diet and well, that shouldn't have any effect on it. Um, so I kind of, I kind of pushed through that and I just kind of chalked it up as something's wrong with me. I need to train harder. And so that's what I did. And I just kind of pushed through the hell of being an athlete on the vegan diet, um, all through college. And then I didn't start like weight training until later in life, later in life, um, post-pregnancy era. And even then I found like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm working out, I'm lifting heavy, I'm doing all of these things. I should be building muscle. And I just wasn't. And I was just gassed all the time. Like I couldn't, I couldn't do more than maybe 30 minutes in the gym of 
mild cardio warm up and then a little bit of weight training and i'd have to like go over and find find john and be like hey i'm gassed i need to go and so i'd go home and chug you know some sort of vegan protein and that would just be the end of it and i'd go you know kill myself in the gym the next day and the day after that and so on but and even then i could never work out fasted which was the biggest concern that just wasn't making sense because I knew working out fasted wasn't necessarily a bad thing. I knew that there were cardio, like metabolic benefits of it. But all of a sudden, now that I'm on the carnivore diet, I find that I work out fasted almost every single morning. I'm lifting heavier than I ever have. I'm putting on muscle like it's nobody's business. And I'm able to get up and do it again the next day. And hey, I you know, emptied the tank completely today, but tomorrow I know I'm going to wake up and I'm going to have the energy to do it. And I'm going to wake up earlier than I ever have. And, you know, at the end of the workout, I'm going to then go power through the rest of my day without feeling like I just wrecked my body in the gym. And I think that that's one of the most amazing things. And my background, my master's is in exercise physiology. And so I see all these online fitness coaches preaching about eating freaking oatmeal and apples and peanut butter and rice crispy treats at the gym and just all this garbage for the body that not only like builds up your toxic buckets, but people preaching and teaching that, oh, you have to have carbs in your system to go make gains. But that couldn't be further than the truth. And the reality of the scientific underpinning for that is so incorrect and just flawed from a physiological standpoint um, that it actually like makes me mad. You can hear like I am fired up. Um, but just that transformation and comparing my ability to perform as a vegan, as an athlete, someone who grew up in that environment to now carnivore just it is literally a night and day difference but like my reality of a carnivore athlete is well i've had two kids and well you shouldn't be able to do that after you have children and so it's really kind of empowering too not only to be able to do it and do it well and then get up and perform again and lift heavy again tomorrow and the day after that but to then take a step back and realize like you know i was bullied for being a overweight as a teenager and here i am as a mom of two busting it in the gym and building a body that everybody said i would never get back and that's just incredible for somebody who's undergone like not just like the psychosis of eating disorders but like the trauma of early childhood being bullied like it's it, it's changed so many aspects of my life this way of eating has well that's so beautiful i'm I'm so happy and proud of your transformation. I know that everybody listening and watching her episode right now can just feel how much passion you have and obviously <laughs> how um, knowledgeable you are. I would love, can you tell me a little bit about what your dissertation is about? Yeah. So my dissertation and my research right now focuses on the carnivore diet and type 2 diabetes. and. The reason that I chose that, well, for one, there, there's two parts to it, right? There's the carnivore diet, and then there's type 2 diabetes. And so the reason that I'm in this space and doing this research is because the global epidemic rates of type 2 diabetes are about 540 million, and it is projected that by the year 2040, these rates are going to increase by over 55%. So, but in the United States alone, we're looking at approximately 40 million people who are diagnosed with type 2, but that doesn't include children with type 2 diabetes, that doesn't include individuals with prediabetes or insulin resistance. And when you think about those numbers and collectively what this population of individuals with metabolic disease are struggling with, right, we have some pretty extensive literature right now on how we can manage type 2 diabetes. And when you look at the recommendations from like the American Diabetes Association and the American Society of Endocrinologists and all of these governing bodies in the, the type 2 diabetes space or the metabolic syndrome space, you see the standard BS recommendations that we have for healthy individuals. And so when you look at 
the reality of type 2 diabetes and the way that it manifests is it's, you know, the, the underlying condition is inflammation. And once you are in a state of inflammation, then your body, that's when you kind of start to hold on to fat and you hold on to that excess energy. And then your body is not burning fat, but building fat from your food. And, um, a carbohydrate at the end of the day, no matter where it comes from, is broken down into sugar. So if you're a diabetic and you have this inability to process carbohydrates, then it doesn't matter if you're eating an apple or eating a candy bar, like that sugar is still sugar. And yes, there is a difference. I will not argue that a candy bar is the equivalent of an apple. I'll never sit and say that. But at the end of the day, every single carbohydrate is broken down into glucose or other monosaccharide precursors, and the body responds to them as sugar, okay? So when you have somebody who has no tolerance for sugar, and we have this situation where the majority of people in our culture are struggling with metabolic diseases... We need real recommendations and real clear advice on not only how do I help one person with this, but how are we going to, as a society, help to get people healthier, right? So when you look at the ADA's website and you see they're recommending things like oatmeal with fruit in the morning and go ahead and make sure, I mean, they have the ADA diabetes plate method, which shows 50% of the plate as non-starchy vegetables, a quarter of the plate as grains, and a quarter of the plate as protein with a fish on it. And then when you actually go in and look at like the categorical outline of how can I, as somebody with diabetes, really build out my nutrition to be health promoting, and then you kind of you kind of scroll down the the page. It starts with carbs, and then it goes into fats, and then it, the proteins are at the bottom. And then it says best protein sources. And you realize if you have any two cents of logical comprehension, comprehension, and just like logical reasoning abilities, you see that they have not so strategically placed their preferred protein sources at the top of the list. And then as you move your way down, this is what we want you to eat less and less of. And Ellie, I kid you not, the first thing on that list is plant-based meat alternatives, ultra-processed, non-food, created no. in a manufacturing industrial setting mixed with chemicals and multiple seed oils. This is what the ADA prefers you to eat to manage your diabetes. But remember, only 25% of your plate comes from that. The other 75 is recommended to be carbohydrates. You as somebody who can't process a carbohydrate, go ahead and eat 75% so that we can keep you sick. And then on top of it, we prefer that you eat protein that is laden with chemicals and going to exasperate your symptoms. And then at the very bottom, it says red meat should be limited and very, very little of a normal healthy diet, especially if you have type 2 diabetes. But go ahead and make sure that if you're going to choose red meat, make sure that it's from choice or select grade of beef, which just infuriates me most because not only do we not want you to eat any red meat, but we want you to make, we want to make sure that the red meat that you're getting is 100% fed with corn and soy and oats and antibiotics and hormones from cows who are held up in a cage in a big industrial warehouse. I drive past one when I go over to Oregon and it's just like, not only do we want you to stay in your disease, but we want you to eat cows that are going to continue to make sure that you have that disease, even if you try to eat beef, okay? Don't ever consider pr prime or grass-fed or regenerative farm. Like, don't choose those beefs. So my reality in my dissertation is I am... Um, I, I see that I see that this is a problem, right? People need clear advice, and the diabetes plate method is not it because that is the furthest thing from clear. And as somebody who has had family members with type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome, I understand the reality of the day to day struggle of well, checking my blood sugar and it goes up and it goes down. It's completely unstable. And well, what am I going to eat? And this this population of people they need clear, concise simple recommendations that they can implement in their daily life. Hey, guess what? Eat fatty red meat 
add nothing else, maybe some eggs, maybe some bacon. But I truly believe that a lion diet for people in this condition is the best way to start off in not only like reducing inflammation and stabilizing your blood sugar levels and allowing the body to heal from the most simple perspective, and then maybe reintroduce those symptoms or those, those other foods. Um, but my goal is to show and to produce the scientific literature because all of the people who have all of the things to say about why you shouldn't do a carnivore diet, one of the first things that, that's, that they say is, well, where's the peer-reviewed research? Where is the evidence-based research? And I, I, I also roll my eyes too because the reality is that the carnivore diet is grounded in the ketogenic diet. A carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet by nature. What is a ketogenic diet? It is very little to no carbohydrates, focus on high fat, high fat, low carb diet, some protein in there as well. If you are in the carnivore space and you do any research, you know that the majority of people are recommending people. I mean, Dr. Barry, Dr. Baker, Dr. Chafee, um, they're all recommending about a 70-30 split fat to protein if your goal is to lose weight and get metabolic diseases into remission. Right. So what I am trying to do is I've chosen a population of people who need some really clear advice and they need something that is going to work, that they can have confidence it's going to work. They don't have questions about what can I eat? What can't I eat? Well, what if I have this? What if I have that? No. Eat animal foods straight from the animal. Get the best source that you can afford, even if it's choice, even if it's select, that's going to be better than anything else that you can get as far as grains or carb, grains or carbs, grains legumes, other plants, fruits, and vegetables, right? Eating red meat at the end of the day is going to be the best thing, right? So I am trying to produce the study, the very, not the very first, we have some seminal research right now from the Harvard guys. That's, um, you know, there are some limitations to it, but I'm trying to build up the evidence, build more scholarly published research that will allow us to begin to do more research that isn't like a an ethical issue with institutional review boards. So the scientific process is very complex. It's long, it's drawn out, and it takes a lot of time. And I think that a lot of the naysayers, not only do they have no understanding of nutrition in the first place, but they don't understand the scientific process. And um, so my goal is to get this PhD published, to try to build some guidelines to help provide I know that we're not. I'm not going to change the ADA's mind. I know that this is an uphill battle. There are so many other elements to our healthcare system and our nutritional recommendations, and I am not going to be the one to solve that right now. Um, but my hope is that, and you know, my plan in life is to be the carnivore diet researcher. And so I'm hoping that this is going to be the first of many, 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 many studies to really kind of give like a gut punch to those people who are like, well, where's your scientific research, right? So I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the biggest, baddest thank you. And I mean that in like, you know, like butter and stuff like that. The most delicious <laughs> grass-fed butter. Thank you uh, yeah. so much for being the one, one of one of many, I hope, soon I hope. to come. It feels like to, one of none. Yeah. <laughs> if, does it feel... A little lonely. Oh, <laughs> do you, totally. Do you get pushback? Do you get pushback? Oh, for all the research? all the pushback. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. No, it's hard. Um, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Just the uh, I'm, and so like I'm not I'm not. It's not published yet. Um, I'm in the right. dissertation proposal stage. So right now I'm trying to convince my my committee of peer reviewers who I got to hand select. Ooh, I got to hand select my peer reviewers, which isn't something you get to do when you're kind of past this stage. But um, and I. I believe that they are very much in the camp of the Mediterranean diet. And I mean, I'm trained in functional medicine. So my PhD is integrative and functional nutrition. And at this point in, in my process, I've done all of my academic coursework. Um, so now I'm just doing my actual research and I've learned all the things. And um, the functional medicine paradigm does not really align with the carnivore diet. And so it's an uphill battle just in the the creation of my paper to convince the school that my research is sound in theory and that it's going to be beneficial. And we have all these anecdotal studies and individuals in this community who have shown that the carnivore diet has improved and reversed their type 2 diabetes. But anecdotal only goes so far, but anecdotal is where you start. 
right? Someone has to show it to be able to get the idea to do the scientific investigation. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a battle just trying to convince them that like, I'm not off my rocker. Like I haven't lost any of my marbles. I've actually gained them all back because of the carnivore diet. And, um, and I know that this is nothing that you guys agree with. And I know that this challenges everything you've taught me up until this point, but I'm here to show that you can be taught all that they want to teach you. And unless you take that next step and ask why or look at it from the other side, right? There's always two sides to the story. And I think that that's the reality of the carnivore diet and functional medicine. Because yes, if you are eating a standard Western diet and you are looking to improve your metabolic diseases, is there an argument that eating a whole food plant-based diet is going to improve your symptoms? No. Is it going to be straightforward? Is it going to then lead to more disease ramifications? Yes, but that's what we don't talk about, right? We kind of avoid that like the plague. We don't talk about plant toxicology. I was told to, ta to take plant toxicology out of my dissertation and um, it's, it, it's a battle. I'm sorry, I'm long-winded. It is a battle. No, like I'm glad, like this is, the reason why I have the show is to share <laughs> your story. And so yeah. I want to know all those details and I want to know yeah. the struggle because it's going to feel so good when it comes out. Yes. And then people can finally shut their mouth <laughs> about, <laughs> about, about the studies because it, yeah. it, it's getting a little ridiculous. Um, Here's one that's you know, like 85 pages long all currently. Yeah. And I'm not done. So. There you go. <laughs> No, yeah. it's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And another thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear, because obviously you're so passionate about this. Um, you must feel so much better knowing that you're feeding your children this way yeah. compared to the vegan vegetarian side of things. Could you tell me about how your children are doing on this? And how does it feel to be a mother knowing that you are going to be potentially reversing any kind of, you know, toxicity that they might've had previously. Yeah. You know, it's, I don't want to say it's, it's been, e I won't say it's been easy because it hasn't. And, um, parenting isn't I'm, easy and it's never easy. No. Just to put that out there. <laughs> oh, totally. Um, the trend, I think the transition has been, it's been pretty smooth. All in all, I will say I'm, I'm really grateful, but I think that the reason for that, Ellie, is because I actually, I sit and I talk to my kids about nutritional biochemistry and I teach them and I'm trying, well, I'm trying to teach them how carbs affect the body and how plants are carbohydrates and how plants also have this little world of toxins that are, you know, carcinogenic. And these foods are linked to disease and these foods make your emotions unstable. And these foods, ha hey, have you noticed that when you have this, your energy goes up and then you go right back down, right? And then you go from really happy to really angry, right? So I'm trying to connect those dots. And um, my three-year-old is just starting to make the connections. Um, but my my oldest son is, um, he's pretty, he's smart as a whip. And I'm, I think a lot of that is because of carnivore. And I've really noticed that his intelligence has has I don't, <laughs> blossomed feels like the wrong word, but I feel like he's blossomed a lot intellectually since we made this transition. My kids are not 100% carnivore. And I think a lot of that is me trying to, well, I'm not trying to preserve anything. I'm the one who's kind of like trying to get them all the way to carnivore, but the process has been slow and it's been a gradual taper. Um, but when I say a taper, I mean like Maybe they have some chips every now and then. Maybe they have a cookie every now and then. We sometimes have ice cream in the house. Maybe they have some ice cream, right? But as far as their main diet goes, I mean, it's what we're eating is what they're eating, right? I don't buy, I don't buy fruit. I don't buy, we have some frozen blueberries because that helps keep the temper tantrums under control sometimes. But, but it's frozen blueberries, right? It's one of the low tox antioxidant is not a word I want to associate with food. Um, 
but it's it's a low sugar sweet reward and bribing works really well sometimes with blueberries i understand (laughs) i absolutely Um, understand yeah um i definitely am not going to say my kids are perfect carnivores either do we primarily keep meat in the house and eggs and butter and yes uh, do yes. our kids eat out and have maybe they have some chicken tenders and fries? Yes. Is it seldom? Absolutely. At least for mm-hmm. us. I yeah. don't want this show to be shaming to anybody. That's why it's called meat based kids. Mm-hmm. We want our children to be eating as much meat as possible. And if we can help it, less and less and less of other things because we know the importance of meat in our yeah. diet. Um, I think it's so great that you feel like they are really coming into their own. Maybe they're having a little bit less brain fog. Maybe they're feeling like their energy is stable throughout the day. And so they're able to make those um, decisions that might've been a little bit more difficult uh, previously, yeah. which is great. I found the same thing too. I have yeah. a three and a half year old and a one and a half year old. and um, you know, my kids predominantly eat a meat-based diet, but we do have some berries and I think that's okay. Strawberries and blueberries. Okay. You know, Mm -hmm. and then when they run out, we run out and then we just keep eating meat. And I, I would love to know how does sugar affect the brain, especially for the minds of developing children? Yeah. Whether it's carbs or a candy bar or whatever, you know, because it's all the same in the end. It is all the same in the end. Um, I think under, so understanding the way that sugar and carbs affect the brain, it's really similar to how like a a drug addict gets their fix, right? So sugar interacts with our dopamine receptors in the brain, and it kind of causes this fire off effect of the neuron signaling. Um, I'm happy now because I have sugar. I'm happy because I got my fix, right? And then when they go without it, they absolutely go into those withdrawal symptoms. Um, So there's there's both the immediate reward, which is elicited by the sugar, right? But what happens is over time is that we kind of get used to it, right? We have an increased need because our kids get used to that feeling. And so what happens is their tolerance goes up, right? Think of alcohol on an alcoholic. If you're completely sober, your first drink, your first beer is going to put you on your tail, right? The first time your kid has sugar ever, which I mean, there will never be studies because of the amount of sugar in like breast milk and and formulas and things like that. So like you said earlier, they are exposed to to toxic foods right from the jump in life, which is terrible. But um, I digress. And what happens is the symptoms get worse, right? So the withdrawal gets worse and the desire and what's going to fulfill them gets amplified over time if you have this continual exposure, right? And so for somebody who, maybe a mom who's trying to or considering going to a meat-based diet or a carnivore or ketogenic diet for their child, when they are transitioning off, I think it's really important, especially with younger children, to do more of a tapered approach and like a gradual reduction and still and still allowing for a little bit of carbs to your child. I think that that's a really beneficial way to ease that process because for a young child specifically, if you take them from a Fruit Loops in the morning with a, you know, Nutri-Grain bar snack, followed by, I don't know, whatever at lunch, a peanut butter jelly, right? That's a normal kid lunch, followed with some apples and some peanut butter and maybe some yogurt, right? And then what's for snack in the afternoon? Maybe some fruit gummies because people think those are actually fruit. Um, what, whatever it may be, and then dinner comes around and it's spaghetti or whatever, right? Moms, we're, we're tired. We're busy. We want dinner on the table. We want it now. We want it dumped from the bag. We want convenience. And we live in this instantaneous gratification-seeking society. And we're teaching our children those things. And then we're training their brains to have that constant 
rapid exposure to sugar, which is giving them a constant fix every couple hours throughout the day. And where this really starts to take effect is when your kids go to school, right? It impacts their ability to learn. The excessive sugar negatively affects cognitive functioning. So that's going to affect their ability to, to focus at school. I mean, hyper in ADHD, ADD, autism, all of these things show to have inflammatory precursors. And when you're con constantly feeding them inflammatory foods, you're teaching your child, whether they're cognitively aware of it or not, you're teaching their chi your child physiologically that this is how we survive, right? But then when you flip the script and you maybe turn that mirror onto yourself, maybe your kid's having some cereal, but oh, well, I'm going to eat oatmeal because it's the healthier choice, right? And I'm going to have, you know, a granola or a protein bar from the healthy section, right? Because that's the healthier choice. But the reality is all of these, you know, protein bars and health foods out there are really just candy remarketed by the food system that knows how to get you addicted. They've taken the science. They understand how sugar affects the brain and they understand the addiction process and they understand how to elucidate the response of your taste buds to crave these foods and they understand the physiology of nutrition, but they are not going to teach you that because their job is to make money to keep and and they are partnered with the medical system and the pharmaceutical companies who, you know, the food's getting you sick and the drugs are keeping you hooked. And at the end of the day, everybody is winning except for you. But you think that you're doing the right thing because you don't know any better. So it leaves parents and people as a whole frustrated and dejected and lost and the nourishment has been redacted because what we've been taught is how to, uh-huh, you're welcome. What we've been taught is what they want us to think is the way to live because at the end of the day, we have a population issue. So how do we maintain the population? Oh, sorry, that went, there. That, that, that went, sorry, that went too far. I... I we have we have agree. a sick care system. We have a sick mm -hmm. care system that is intended Absolutely. to keep you sick. And it's no lie when you go and do the research and look at the associations between big pharma and big food and the medical schools and the FDA and who's funding the studies that are being published and promoted mm -hmm. to you through big, big media. And it makes me so freaking mad because people like Dr. Baker and Dr. Chafee and, and me and Dr. Tina Moore and people who are trying to spread the word about the reality of life and how to care for your health and build health and health is wealth. And that's the best thing that you can give your child at the end of the day is a healthy childhood, right? Who want, what parent wants an 18 year old who is already metabolically ill? We have a child obesity epidemic on our hands. And if you think about COVID, that was a pandemic. That is much, much, much smaller than an epidemic. Your child yes. is overweight by the time that they're 10 years old. What is their reality going to look like when they're 18? If you as a parent don't get control over it. And I am not chastising. I am not judging. I am here to help and to teach and for, for parents to understand that it's not just your life. It's not just your choices. And I understand all the things and the stress and the money challenges and the day-to-day -day life struggles that go into this. But if you are truly invested in your children and your health, then you need to consider that at the end of the day, the biggest thing that you're going to do for your child is feed them nature and nurture. How you nurture your child to have the best health and the best potential in life cognitively, socially, you know, all in all of these avenues of holistic life come from a come from seeking a lifestyle that goes back to nature. Right? Go back to the reality of getting food from from the earth, right? Go eat straight from the cow. Drink the raw milk. These things aren't going to give you disease. They're going to give you health, but you're not going to hear about it if you don't go and seek the information. Um, I completely agree with you. Like everything you said, I I wish I could speak as eloquently as you do and with this such passion. But I'm so glad you can do it for me. So, and you can, and I know that that's gonna like raise some eyebrows. People might be watching oh, this totally. and going, like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And it's going to be able Sorry. to open up the floodgates yeah. and 
that they can start to do their own research and you maybe even bringing it on to themselves to take the first step in trying a keto or carnivore diet. Question that I had from a subscriber, and it's a little long, but if, if you could please help us out with that. Um, yeah. I think there's something important we must address for parents raising their kids as carnivores. Breast milk is high in fat, but also high in glucose, higher than cow's milk. Because babies' brains are growing so quickly and require a lot of energy, uh, for adults, our liver makes the glycogen that our brain require for enzymatic action, but a baby's yeah. liver doesn't have the capacity yet. That's why they have the pot bellies. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why breast milk is sweet. Mm -hmm. and infants and toddlers are being fed a low or zero carb diet. Will it be bad for their brain development? Um, and then yeah. they think that uh, I would say if children are being breastfed and they are breastfed past four to five years of age then they do need carbs so what do you think about that i was yeah yeah i mean that's a great question and you know a lot of what this um this viewer thank you for your comment um and your question i think it is really important so when you consider the brain's needs especially in infancy um you know evolutionarily our species was designed to thrive on breast milk um, or a mother's milk, regardless of whether you're talking, you know, humans or cows or goats, right? Mammals are designed to live and thrive off of breast milk. And the concern over the, the brain growth, right? Well, when you look at the nutritional quality of red meat, right? And a carnivore diet, there is plenty of sources of DHA. And DHA is that main, um, that main acid that's needed for neurodevelopment. Um, so as far as the question in asking what the transition would look like, and I, I don't think there's absolutely any need for carbs um, after but I mean, at any point, right? Breast milk aside, um, I don't think there's any need right? There is no physiological need for carbohydrates in the body. Again, as they've said, the liver does produce the glucose that is needed for brain functioning, um, but the brain also runs on ketones. And I think that that's often overlooked because the way that the body works is when there's carbs in the system, we're going to be running on glucose. And when there's ketones in the system, we're running on ketones. Um, I forget who gave the analogy. It's incredible. But when you put you know, Tesla parts on the Porsche, we're going to have problems, right? So you want to give the Tesla its Tesla parts and you want to give the Porsche its Porsche parts. And so, you know, one of my favorite um, leaders and thought leaders and experts in this space is um, Judy, Tr Judy Cho. She's nutrition with Judy. Um, she talks about how she breast fed her youngest exclusively. I want to say for two years, do not quote me on that, um, but go look look her up, look up, look up her book, The Carnivore Cure. Um, I know she talks a lot about breastfeeding. That's not my area of expertise, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it is, um, but I think there's absolutely no argument for introducing carbohydrates to your child after weaning them from breast milk. There is extensive comprehensive nutrition in the carnivore diet and a lion diet or ketogenic diet um, that is going to support your child's physiological needs for growth and neurodevelopment. There is nothing that carbohydrates are going to do that you can't provide for them from animal sources. Well, thank you so much for that. I, I hope that that answer helps that viewer and I appreciate you taking the time to answer that for us. Um, yeah. I want to are, are you, are we good on time? Can we do maybe one I'm okay. more question? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Of okay, course. great. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, so what would you, what kind of advice would you give to a parent that's like, okay, carnivore is the way to go. Um, what would, what kind of advice would you give to them? Say if they, their kid is, you know, addicted to these like protein bars and these gummies that, you know, pop tarts and all that stuff. You did mention tapering off. What kind of foods mm -hmm. would you first introduce? Like, how would you go about it? And how did you go about it with your kids too, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah. So I'll start with what I did with my kids and then kind of go into maybe how I would have done things a little bit differently, if that's okay. Um, Great. But I think an, an important preface to the 
this question is first off in understanding the age of your child. And um, I know in our in our last call, Ellie, um, we kind of talked about different childhood stages. And um, I think if you have older children, and by older children, I'm talking like nine, 10 and up, the way that I would approach it would be a cut and dry, you know what? I have stepped into a reality where I know more about nutrition and I know how these foods affect you. We're going to have a really hard couple of days as we break this addiction. But I would just explain to them what this looks like, what the current foods that they're eating are doing to them and how it's affecting them in school and behavior and all of these ways of life. Um, But for older children, and, and like that's speaking as if your whole household is on board with this, um, which I know is a challenge for many, many people. Um, make it a family decision. Sit down and have that discussion. As a parent, you have that right. As a mother, you have the right to say, this is what we're going to eat and this is how we're going to live our life. And then my goal isn't to overpower you and to force you into a reality that maybe you don't agree with. But one of the things that I tell I tell my kids all the time is, is I I say um I say what's my job? I look at my kid when they're throwing a fit over sugar and I say what is my job? And my kids know to keep me safe, right? My my job as your mom is to keep you safe, right? Does that mean that my job entails keeping you healthy? Yes. Does keeping you safe mean giving you foods that are going to affect your ability to be healthy? No right? I will not give you foods that will not allow me to do my job, right? God trusted me to be your mama. And I believe that this is the way that we should eat because I want you to live the healthiest, happiest life full of the greatest potential. And it's going to start today and it's going to be hard, but I'm going to go through this too, right? I'm going to make this change right here with you. Right. So that's assuming that your child is at that that comprehensive ability to maybe understand, maybe go into that conversation with some notes. Right. I don't think it's ever a bad thing to be prepared for a conversation. Back yourself up. Be prepared for the protest. Be prepared for the frustration. But sit in the comfort of knowing that this too shall pass. They will not stay mad at you forever, right? We always swore we were going to be mad at our mom forever. But here we are. Are we still mad at our mom for something she did when we were 10 years old? No, absolutely not. Hopefully. Hopefully, right? Um, In the context of providing a nutritive environment for your children, right? That's not an anger that they're going to hold on to forever. And then so be it when they turn 18, hopefully you've instilled in them the information to live a healthy life. They will make their choices, period. Okay. I think this looks different for younger children. My kids were four and two when I we made a night and day shift. I mean, when I say, Ellie, I opened the trash can and I went whoosh, through the fridge, I went whoosh through the fridge. Everything was out. I was a vegan. My kids were vegan. Yeah. It all went in the trash. That which we could donate, we absolutely donated and took to the food shelter. But right, perishables, no, that's going in the trash. Yeah. Um, But as far as getting children on board, I think the majority of your focus should be on the, on the meals right? At this meal, we are going to make the majority of our plate animal protein, fatty red meat, right? Steak, chicken, pork, whatever you choose, however you choose to go about this change, make sure that your primary meals are in alignment. And then when your child says, mama, I really want something sweet, or I really want something, or I need a snack. I think be prepared to have something on hand. I think blueberries, as we already discussed, are is a, is a great bargaining chip because they are pretty sweet. I know at first when you're breaking that carb addiction, your taste buds are actually like little receptors for, and they kind of align with what's happening in your gut microbio, microbia because when you're craving carbs, it's because the bacteria in your gut are like the community of bacteria are thriving on carbs bacteria. That's the really scientific term for it. Um, But essentially when your gut says, hey, I'm happy on carbohydrates, you go, ooh, I want more carbs. And so when you taste things that are like, say, like like an element, the electrolyte supplement, you go, 
holy smokes, that's straight from the ocean for the first time. And then as you begin to kind of go down this journey, hey, the bacteria on your tongue change, the bacteria in your gut are going to change. And guess what? They're going to change in your kid too. So their desire and their cravings are also going to adapt. And hey, that blueberry that wasn't so sweet a week ago is now all of a sudden really, really sweet. So I think having things like some some low fructose berries on hand, some blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, even tart cherries, um, I think those are okay to have on hand for a while and as necessary for like bargaining again for young children. But also having things like they do make healthier versions of snacks, right? So I think it's like the brand is bare naked um, and they're like fruit roll-ups and it's, they're mostly just apple juice, right? But there's like apples, pears, and strawberries, right? They're all the same. Um, those are really great for, hey, my kid wants a treat and I'm usually giving them this and it's usually Welch's gummy bears, but now we're going to switch to this. And then the way that I did it with my kids is like, I kind of stocked up the pan the pantry or the freezer or whatever it was with the alternatives, healthier alternatives. And then once this is gone, this is gone. And we're going to take that next step towards a healthier alternative. And so kind of gradually tapering. And I'm not going to sit and pretend like this is going to happen in a month, honey. Like, no, this is going to take time. My children still struggle with carbohydrate addiction, especially around this time of year. It's holidays every other week, it seems like. And the schools and the preschools. And so my three-year-old came home yesterday with a little, a, a big bag of lots of processed sugar and junk and that makes it hard, right? So I have to go and kind of rifle through all that and throw away the stuff, but not completely take away the childhood, if that makes sense. So I think you have to pick and choose your battles. You have to kind of have a system. You have to have a plan for how you're going to approach it because if you approach it without a plan, it's going to be a hot mess, right? So that's why like working with, so I'm, I'm a functional wellness practitioner and what I do is like I help people with this transition process and I help people, um, kind of switch and go from whatever unhealthy life they're living and to stepping into using the carnivore diet as a way to reverse disease and to help their children. Um, so I think working with somebody is also really, really, really helpful because you have somebody who's like, you know, a practitioner who's in your corner, who understands where you're coming from, where your goal is, and recognizing that this is going to be a journey is really, really important. And you have to hold on to that. And you have to also realize that like, these are your children, mama. Like we're going to do the best we can 90, 95% of the time. But then at the end of the day, like still allow them to be a child. I don't see any issues with that. A little treat every now and again is okay. I hope that answered the question. Yes. Thank you so much. I completely agree with that. Um, I do want to be uh, mindful of your time. Can you please this is your opportunity to plug anything. Please tell us where we can find you and we can help support you in any way, shape, or form. I'd love to give you this opportunity, please. Yeah. So um, my, I have a new YouTube channel. It is very new. It is very naked. Um, it's I'm at The Holistic Carnivore on YouTube. My Instagram is much more bountiful. Um, I'm at The Holistic Carnivore PhD on Instagram. My wellness practice is HC Wellness, Holistic Carnivore Wellness. And like I said, what I do is I help people who maybe you're struggling with weight loss or maybe you have some autoimmune disorder. Maybe you are just you're okay. Everything's fine. You want to take this next step to kind of transition into the goal of optimal health. That's what I do. And I like to work, I like to work specifically with women and moms. And um, so, yeah, you know, my, my training is in functional medicine and um, I really align with the functional medicine paradigms through the carnivore or ketogenic or BBB and E, however you kind of want to approach it. And one of my most important things for how I practice is um, I don't have a cut and dry practice, right? I'm going to talk to Ellie and I'm going to get to know you and what you want to do and where you want to go and how you want to get there. And my goal is to always meet my clients where they're at and to get them where they want to be in the way that also is respective to life and day-to-day -day hardships and I also take a really holistic approach to that. I have um, my, my doctoral specialty or like 
minor, I guess, is in mind and body medicine, because I think that there's a huge element to life and stress and uh, food and the way that we achieve wellness has a lot to do with our mind and body. And I think it's really important that we treat the body as a whole, not as a some of its parts, right? Um, so I take a really, really comprehensive approach. So that's what I do. That's what I love to do. Um, but as far as like moving forward, one thing that I really need, Ellie, is I need people who are on a carnivore diet or who have been on a carnivore diet for at least six months. Um, I need to collect participants for my, my research. Um, I can't collect any data yet. I cannot, um, I can't reach out to people and like recruit yet or anything like that, but I can share about my research and I can share what I'm doing. And I really need people who, um, who've maybe had some blood work done, who have like pre-diabetes or type two diabetes specifically, that's what I'm looking at. Um, so I need that population of people who can show this is where I was before carnivore. I've been carnivore for at least six months. Um, carnivore specifically is what I'm looking at. And, um, and this is where I'm at now. This is what my blood work shows at least six months later. Um, so if anybody who's watching or listening or catches the replay on this, if that is you, please connect. Please give me a follow. Um, my goal is to be collecting data this summer. So I will be sharing that on my on my Instagram. <laughs> be ready for that to come out a lot. Um, and I'll be talking about it, of course, on my YouTube channel, which PhD is intense. My YouTube channel is secondary to my research, so it's going to be a slow grow on there. So don't expect much, but I'm working on it. <laughs> no, you've been, it's been such an absolute delight chatting with you and picking your brain. And I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you're doing and the time that you've given me today. I know you're going to continue to change so many lives as you continue to do your research and connect with more, uh, of us on YouTube. Um, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for being on Mother Knows Best. And um, I will make sure to put any important links that you'd want me to share or, um, and I encourage everyone to go subscribe and follow Courtney on her respective <laughs> pages. Uh, thank you so much, Courtney. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you for having me. Like, I, cl I clearly love talking about this. And I really love just like connecting with other people who have a really similar mindset. And I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And I can be really intense sometimes. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that it's important to be passionate about something in life. And, you know, until recently, and I literally texted my girlfriend this, like, a week ago ago, a week ago ago, man, I'm getting tired. Um, <laughs> but a, a week ago, you know, I, I'm actually not working at the elementary school anymore. I, um, oh, I okay. stepped away to fully focus on my PhD because I want to get this research out there. So I am, I took, took a step back. We took a little hit in life and, um, I am fully focused on my doctorate because I'm ready to start getting the more studies out, right? We need this data. We need to show that this is not just one-off situations. This is a way of life that is transforming hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And it's not anecdotal and it's not bullshit. And I'm sorry, but this is, it is evidence-based to the core. If I ever saw anything with regard to nutrition that was grounded in the science, this is it. But because it goes against so many walls, we're, I'm, we get, we get smacked by a big wall. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. yeah. Um, so, but my, my point is, man, I, I take, I see a rabbit hole and I make like Alice and I just <laughs> dive right in. Um, so I, I appreciate it. The past few weeks, I've just been working on my doctorate and um, I texted my friend because the days I take my kid to school and then I pick him right up and it seems like that seven hours just goes like that. And I'm like, you know what? I finally understand that that silly old saying that you do what you love and you never work a day in your life. And it's like, I love this so much. And I love helping people to discover how to rediscover their health and I hate to say wake up because that's being used so excessively in our culture now, but like wake up to the reality of your grandparents had it right. Their parents had it right. It's this corporate system that we live in now that has so negatively affected our ability to thrive as humans and people don't deserve to live a life of misery and you don't deserve the reality that is being pushed upon us. And 
I just want to help people. And so I, I just want to teach everybody about this and teach them all the things about nutrition and holistic health. And I love it. And I just haven't worked a day in the past couple of days and it's just been incredible. So I'm passionate. I am long-winded. I, I love this. Thank you for having me. I'm so grateful for you and your time and your community welcoming me. Thank you. Of course. Um, I would love to have you on the show again if you're interested, because there's a lot more that we can go into. <laughs> um, I think totally. this, Anytime. Is, this is an ever-growing <laughs> topic. And as time goes on and your research um, becomes, you know, you need more participants and stuff like that. If you'd mm -hmm. like, we can, we can collaborate again to recruit some totally. of those people. Um, yeah. I want to wish everyone a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.